Welcome to the RSP cast. This is episode four of Scout Talk with Russ Landy. Russ, welcome back. Hey, man, thanks for having me back. I'm so excited. I love doing these things. The the enjoyment I get from being able to really get into the nitty gritty of scouting is, is one of the highlights of my week. Yeah, me too, man. And so if this is your first time listening to this, this is a um, twice monthly show that we do where we get a chance to talk about topics that we believe are relevant to scouting in terms of evaluating players or in terms of lessons that we've learned. And today we're going to talk about and then we also usually also talk about players that have caught our eye as we're scouting for the 2020 draft. And we're going to do that. But our first two topics today, we're going to talk about um, Mitchell Trubisky and the article that came out in the Chicago Tribune um, that was an in-depth piece discussing the decision to draft him by Dan Weiderer and Rich Campbell, um, and that was published on November 12th. And then we're also going to talk about um, three of uh, each of our biggest misses of players that we've scouted in the past and why we thought they were big misses. Um, but so to start off, you know, I, you know, I read this piece last week on why did the draft, the Bears draft Mitch Trubisky over Patrick Mahomes and Deshaun Watson, and I think it just covered so much about you know their decision making process from you know from different people inside the building who talked about um, you know some of the thinking. Some of it probably was speculation based on you know what they thought Ryan Pace was thinking um, and there are thoughts about him and what maybe he entered in in some sort of journal and and the interviews that they had and the dinners that they had with these different players um, that they considered and it, you know and and the influences with it so what I wanted to ask you is what struck you about the article what struck you about um, you know, the picking Mitch Trubisky and what you thought about Trubisky, as well as um, I think more than anything, how, you know, is there anything about this also just the decision-making process that you saw either they're talking about in the article or in, or just overall when it comes to quarterbacks, you know, what do you think about all of this? Well, you know, I think two things jumped out at me in this, and I understand um, what happened, um, but I do think there was there were reasons it happened. I mean, when I first started reading the article, and I think it was early on, they start literally saying that the Bears behind closed doors, Ryan Pace, and I like Ryan. I've met him a few times, very smart guy, unbelievably hard worker and good person. Um, I think they had decided from the article that, hey, we are taking a quarterback and they basically decided that back in June the year before. Like they had sort of said, we need to find a new quarterback, so we are going to go down this road, so we're going to put all this attention in the quarterbacks. And while it's great to say you want to find one, I think sometimes when you do that, you put a little blinders on because you're saying we have to find a guy. So you're almost going to sometimes see the good and not see the bad. Um, yeah. And I think the other part of this that they didn't really dive, they dove into a little bit because they talked about Breeze, but they didn't really talk about the fact that Ryan grew up basically within the Saints organization. Ryan was a a college defensive end, um, started at the bottom as an intern slash assistant with the Saints, and I think was there for 14 years uh, before coming to the Bears. And it's not just about Drew Breeze. It's about Sean Payton and the offense that he runs – the players that fit that offense. And I think when you look at what Drew Brees has done, a lot of his success and that offense's success is traditional, catch the ball, set up in the pocket, throw the ball. It's not a real reliant offense on improvisation, on making plays with your feet, scrambling, making big throws on the move. Not that Brees doesn't ever do that, but it's not predicated on his success and the offense's success isn't predicated on that. So I think some of that over 14 years of being in the same organization gets sort of trained into your head. So I think when they start, when they say we're going to find a quarterback and you start going to look at Trubisky, and you start going to look at Mahomes and, and Watson and there are even some other quarterbacks, I think those quarterbacks that are more traditional in that offense that you've grown up learning about scouting in are going to probably – be ranked higher on your sort of mental checklist because they check the boxes of what you're used to as opposed to sort of having to say, okay, let's think outside the box. These other guys, Mahomes, yeah, it may not be traditional and he may do some things that 
maybe will frustrate you at times because he will throw the ball up for grabs or he'll take some gambles or Watson is just very sort of <clears throat> unsystematic. He just relies on a rare natural feel for football and an intelligence to sort of figure things out on the fly. And I think that inherent learning when you're in that 14, 13 years of learning that this is the way you look for a quarterback, I think that influenced their initial views on players. And you can probably speak to this, Matt, from – your years of doing the RSP is, and I've and I've stressed this a lot with scouts, young scouts, is you don't want the first game you evaluate a player to change or to set your opinion in stone. But oftentimes it is very hard to come off that initial evaluation that you make in that first game because if you see a great, if you think he was great, every mistake in other games after that, you're knocking down a little bit, but you're still starting from great. Whereas if he has a terrible game. You're starting low, and he has to really climb to get higher. And I think it's inherent in everybody that first impressions make a big deal. And I think in this case, a lot of the things were lined up for Pace to think a quarterback like Trubisky with great physical tools who was more traditional in a lot of his ways of doing things would sort of grab his attention first. I think the way that you described that's so good because <laughs> it makes so much sense about how he was – his – way of looking at quarterbacks was formulated and how that meshed well early enough to really lend that impression and and how that was also reinforced by what you know by the organizational thinking and success that he had coming up in an nfl organization he's going to be he's going to get positive reinforcement for thinking along the lines, along those type of lines, and then seeing players like that, and then having other people within the building probably look at that and go, yeah, this guy, he's got these tools, he has these different components that we're looking for. Because, yeah, when you looked at Mitchell Trubisky, did he have good feet to drop back? Yeah, absolutely. Did he have the arm to be able to make all the throws? You, you know, do you need him to drop back three, five, seven, and then hit the, the deep comeback to hit the deep out? Can he, you know, can you throw those type of power, intermediate and vertical type of, you know, targets? And he was probably, you know, he and Mahomes were the two guys that were probably best equipped to do that, whereas a guy like Watson really didn't have that type of game. So if you're looking for an offense, if you're trying to, use and have a certain offensive style and match the player to the offense, then Mitchell Trubisky makes sense. It just then comes down to the idea of does he really fit? Because I think, you know, for the luxury that the, probably the blessing and the curse that I've had as an independent person who, who's training through watching games is far away from what the NFL has, has been is that I would look at, it gave me a little, probably a little more freedom without someone knocking me down. And more of say, an open mind too. And more of an open mind to, to look at someone and go, what makes Brett Favre great in the same way of what makes, you know, Tom Brady great in the same way of what makes, you know, uh, Michael Vick really good or great at times. And, and seeing that there's different styles of quarterbacking that can work, but what are things, how do they match up with the system and then how do you – do you match the system to the player? Do you match the player to the system? And those are – and I don't think there's one answer to, to, to that question. But I think that I looked at I looked at this and I think that, you know, the question I, I would have following up to you about this is when I saw Mitchell Trubisky the, and when I saw Patrick Mahomes, I, I you know, I really loved Patrick Mahomes and – and because I had that kind of ability to have the open mind due to my background, I thought Patrick Mahomes had the highest grade I've given a quarterback. And, and it was mainly because I felt like that there was a difference between his, most of the time I saw, even the, there was an LSU game that was horrific, but it was like the worst. It was when I watched that game, that was the worst time I saw him make reckless throws that crossed the line from bold to reckless. And then there are other throws that I, I'd see other people and we'd I'd see other people who would who would watch tape or or mention something and they would label it on Twitter or they would we'd talk about it and they'd say, I thought it was this was a reckless play. And I'd look at it and I'd think, well, he read the le re leverage of the defense correctly. I and I think he knew he could do it. 
And I, and, and I think that because he knew he has the special skills to do it, the, the question is going to be, can he do that in the NFL? And can we project that he can do that in the NFL? And I think most people will probably say no, but I think he's the exception in this case. But the thing is, is that, you know, with that in mind, I, I think that I saw a player who reacted to the speed of instinct in terms of his decision making. Whereas with Trubisky, I felt like he was one of those guys that needed boundaries in a way that weren't positive. Like, you know, like there's there are inherent things about people's games. Like to me, Mitchell Trubisky inside the 20s, whether it's in, backed in his own territory or in the red zone, he's he was a guy that his decision making just kind of goes haywire when pressure arrives running towards the boundary and not getting rid of the ball soon enough um throwing the ball into traffic throwing the ball across his body into areas that just made no sense and that you couldn't even track where he was reading any leverage points to say that made sense to try to do um and I, and I felt like that this was a guy who had tremendous athletic gifts, but there were conceptual parts of his game that were fundamental to managing football that I just didn't see. And I it was really concerned about him that way. And with, and on the opposite end, everyone was calling Patrick Mahomes reckless. And I thought I get that to the extent that his footwork is not nearly as pretty. Um, it, it doesn't fit this, the schematic form, but at the same time, he was, you could, you could chart what he was doing or say, why did he make that throw? And without even talking to him, you could say, well, the safety was turned here. And while the window was small, he anticipated it. You can like look at the logic and see the logic of his game. What you just saw was that he was daring and, and that he could do it. And I remember even like seeing that reinforced on like something as, you know, show busy as like the Gruden show that they did the quarterback camp. And they asked him, you know, John Gruden asked him, why do you do that? And he said, because I can, you know, and it just made <laughs> me laugh because I thought when I watched his game, I thought it, everything he did made sense. It, for the most part, it was just because he could. And he's and if he gets with an organization that recognizes that in him and doesn't try and change him, he could be fantastic and he and we saw where he went and the rest is history but i guess all of that to say is when i read this article i thought are we are we as a, a an evaluation community do we sometimes overemphasize the physical tools and the technical tools to the detriment of thinking that they're that quarterbacks are going to learn the conceptual stuff by being on the field through experience. And maybe if at this level, if they're not doing it at the college level at this point, maybe they're never going to learn it. Um, because I, I'm kind of thinking that after this many years, if you don't know how to protect the ball on a consistent basis inside your own 20s, you know, inside your own 20 or in the red zone, and you don't have the timing down to see things or wait for things to open up, I don't think you're going to have the confidence. I don't think you're going to gain that confidence or that belief through that muscle memory. You know, well, it's very hard to NFL. change once you're at the pro level. I mean, they make incremental changes, small things you can do to a guy, but inherently certain guys, it's, it's sort of ingrained. And, and I think one of the things you pointed out there, and I think it's it really, it's sort of something that's overlooked is when you watch Mahomes or even Deshaun Watson, one of the things you're forced or they force you to identify with them is you can tell whether they're instinctive or not because they're not staying with always the flow of the, the, the structure of the play and they're having to react and make plays off of that. Oftentimes when a quarterback is a pocket passer like Trubisky was at UNC, it was hard to always figure out is he instinctive because he's literally just dropping back and just – check in the box, go through progression. And while it's wonderful to have a guy who can drop back and go through progressions, you then have to make a good decision and be instinctive. And what I what I was taught early on, and, and I tend to think this is part of Mitch's problem, and there have been other quarterbacks, I thought Jay Cutler was very similar in this, is that there are quarterbacks like a Phillip Rivers or a Tom Brady or a Pat Mahomes who I feel are, throw, are sort of anticipatory. They throw it to where the guy's going to be. 
They yes. feel where he's going to be in that. Whereas when I look at Trubisky, and I remember this with Cutler, and I don't know if it's a lack of instinct, a lack of, even though they're both, I mean, Cutler is a very smart person, and Trubisky supposedly is very smart and does well in interviews and does well when you put X and O's on the board. Does he not read and feel and sense the defense when he's in the game? And the reason I say that is when I watch Trubisky, I see him as a throw two as opposed to a th- like an anticipatory guy. Is I see him as a guy when he sees the receiver turn to him and he sees the chest, that's when the light goes off and he's like, all right, let's throw the ball. You can't do that in the NFL. No. Because the talent level is so great. And, the, and the, when a player in college is open, it's often by three or four yards. In the NFL, if you're open, it might be half an arm length. Yes. And, and if you're waiting for him to turn and show his chest to you so you can say, yep, he's open, and rifle that ball in, there's – now, not every time. Some guys, some throws are going to be perfect and it's going to be good. But if you're waiting from the turn, that defender knows it. The defense understands this is what we're looking at in this quarterback, and they're going to be attacking all the time. And I just think when I watch Trubisky, I don't see an instinctive guy. I see a very by-the-numbers guy who can't adjust what he's doing. He doesn't understand how coverages move and change, even if it's a cover two. Every cover two is not the same every single snap, even if the call is the same in the huddle. And I don't think he seems to be the type who can see the subtle differences. Oh, this safety is cheating this way because of what we're doing on offense. He is sort of locked in, okay, cover two, this is where this guy will be, and we're throwing it. And he doesn't. I don't know what it is. When I watched him at UNC, I saw the flashes, but I just looked at him and said, gosh, I don't see a quarterback. I see a great athlete who happens to have a big arm, but he's not natural. And a longtime scout said his biggest concern, besides the fact that he backed up a complete reject and couldn't win the starting job for the first three years of his college career, was that you would go to games and he literally would have games where he made no impact, either positive or negative. And he goes, Russ, he goes, good NFL quarterbacks always grab your attention. He said, you never come out of a game going, was he even playing? He said, you did that with Mitch a lot because he didn't do anything to separate himself from an average college quarterback. And that, to me, is what separated him from Mahomes. And even, and I mentioned to you, Watson, I had a lot of trouble evaluating. But there was no doubt that he had a feel and an instinct. Now, I didn't know if he could function or if a team was going to build that offense to help him function in a non-traditional way, but you could sense that he knew what was going on. He could he could see the defense, see things going on, and he could adjust and instinctively understand where openings were coming. I never saw that with Trubisky, and I think that's one of his biggest problems now. Is I just don't think he's a natural guy when he's in the pocket seeing what's in front of him. Yeah, and I think that that's one of the key things that you mentioned is – there are a lot of guys who they can explain to you what's happening on a whiteboard. They yep. can explain to you all the nuts and bolts in theory, but when they get on that stage and they actually have to perform it, they they can't perform it. Whereas there are other guys who can get up there and they may not be able to explain to you in the technical terms, you know, as well or you know, all the theory behind it to the to the nth degree, but when they're on the field, they 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 don't make the mistake like they yep. feel they see it it's just like there's musicians who play by ear and they and they can do really sophisticated harmonic things and then they're and but if you ask them to explain the harmonic theory behind it they some may be better than others and then there are some who have no ear at all but they could like give you a music theory lesson and i think that in 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 football it's similar where we have guys who i mean think about think about a guy like dan orlovsky who's on tv right now who you know does a great job being able to you know break down um football in the way that he had um but he was not a starting quarterback and you know at that level in the nfl um you know and i think that that shows you that there's kind of a gulf between you know someone who knows about the game but who can perform what they know about the game at that level you know obviously it it also reminds me of brandon Whedon because you mentioned orlovsky Whedon was big strong kid interviewed him at the senior bowl super bright i mean knew the x's and o's could do all that but when he gets in the game it's like orlovsky it seems like he slows down but the game speeds up and and it's not a lack of intelligence it's a lack of your brain just functions in a different way. It doesn't take those periphery things and 
engulf them in your brain and turn it into a reaction instantly. Yeah. I mean, Alex Smith to me was a good example of a guy who gave you, who could help your team to a degree with talent around it, who, who's had, who had a long career as a starter, but you could see that when it came to throws that a quarterback needed to make to lift his team, to really do something, to be the guy that's going to carry the team on its, on his back, you could see the extra step or two or extra beat or two or yep. extra hitch on the throw waiting for the chest to turn open. When you could see like body language wise, if you know what you're supposed to be looking for as a quarterback, I can watch on tape and go, I know this is when the ball's supposed to come out, but here are the, here's the two little beat steps that he took because he saw what he was supposed to see but he didn't trust it until he saw the final thing. And at that point, now the cornerback's been able to um, adjust and recover. And now the the cornerback's able to knock the ball away. If he had thrown it two beats earlier, the cornerback has no shot on the ball, even though he's an, half an arm length away. And it's like, when I watch that, the more I watch that, the more I start to think to myself, I, I'm I'm kind of wanting to be more of a hard ass about how I evaluate quarterbacks. But the problem with that is I, I need to, I don't want to go too far because I don't want to be like, well, you know, two thirds of the of quarterbacks can play. <laughs> yeah, can play because that would be, that's not true, but it's like I do, but I'm almost kind of at the point where I want to say, well, you know, probably, probably there's only going to be one or two starting prospects per year at, yeah. per year at best at yeah. best there may be years that i may just i may just be looking at it and going well they don't have this and i know they don't have it so they're gonna get a and and i'm i'm kind of already there it's, i can see myself already writing up in profiles where it's like this guy is going to get an opportunity to start because these physical tools are too hard to ignore and that the way the league looks at this that he's going to check off all the boxes and he's going to get at least a year or two. He may even have a year where things look successful for him, but I, but I don't believe he's going to be able to make up the gulf with his, with his, you know, reaction time to do this type of work on a consistent basis. And as a result, I don't think he's going to be a long-term starter in the league and just, and, or he may end up being a journeyman on a team where he starts like sporadically throughout his career and just, and I, and I can see myself writing that up far more often than I used to a hundred percent on this experience. Yeah, no, there's no question. And I will say for those people who, cause we're talking, obviously we've been talking about Trubisky, Mahomes and Watson. If you want to really learn about sort of seeing guys that throw it almost you you almost think that they shouldn't be throwing it because it's so early, but it turns out they literally hit the guy at full speed. Go back and watch the greatest show on turf when they had Kirk Warner and Mark Bolger back to back. The two of them were two of the best that I've ever seen. And they would throw the ball four or five strides before the receiver and got, even got to the point, often before he even made his break. And I remember sitting and watching the film saying, how did he feel confident enough? to let that ball go when there's literally at times there was a defender with his back to it, but right where he's throwing it. But he knew that Isaac Bruce in two and a half seconds or a second half was going to cover those four or five steps and the ball was literally going to hit him in the hands. And if you want to get a feel for great anticipatory throwing and guys that just had a feel, they may not have had the most physical tools in terms of arm strength or foot quickness or athleticism, go watch Warner and Bulger. The way they did it, I think to me, Mike Martz's offense and the way they did it changed a lot of what NFL teams tried to do because it really allowed you to say, you know what, if we have a guy we can trust, we're going to really spread this out. We're going to become a, 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 a wider offense. We're going to use the whole horizontal field and the deep field instead of it being more narrow because guys can't anticipate as much. Yeah, I think that's a absolutely fantastic recommendation. And it's one of those situations where – Man, I just I just think it's a it's a really good way for people to to kind of look at how it, you know what's important about quarterbacking and it is and I do think it does come down to how do you I, I think that whether it's Mike Martz's offense or whether it's um, 
what Patrick Mahomes does or what, what Deshaun Watson does. The root of it is, can they, can they deliver the ball in an accurate, in a repeatably accurate way? Um, is it, you know, can, is it explainable? Is it logical? Is it something that you can project as repeatable? And, and I think that if, if that's, if that works and it's a simplistic way of talking about it, but I think at its core, that's, that's how it works for me. Like I, I used to think about the whole Tim Tebow experiment and people would talk about his release and how elongated it was. And I remember thinking, well, I know what they're talking about, but the, the release was slow and the thinking was slow. Um, and that was the problem. But I could look at, I could take Brett Favre's releases and he's, I've seen him in his early, you know, in his late, late stages of his career, bring the ball down in a tight pocket and bring the ball down to his knee and yeah. throw the ball, uh, you, you know, and have no problem doing that. And I took pictures of it. I remember during a playoff game and like showed it up, show, showed it as just saying, here's Brett Favre doing what, telling everybody what he can't do. And I think the, the importance of that is if you're, you know, I can bring, we can always bring up outliers, you know, yeah. all day long. And, and, and I'm always, I'm always good at being able to do that. <laughs> but, <laughs> but the important part of that is that you, you better be able to root any type of outlier thinking in, is it something that can be repeated and deliver over and over again? Because if it can't, then you're probably just liking the player more than you should. And yep. you can't explain why it's happening. And if, and if you can't fully explain why it's happening, odds are against you for making a good argument about it. No question. No question. You have to be able to put it in words because otherwise you're just sort of falling in love with an athlete or a guy who does one thing very well, but is not a complete player. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, to yeah. me, I mean, that that's part of it because I just watch this and I go, uh, you, you know, you explained to me what was so nice about this piece is because I'm sitting here thinking, well, Ryan Pace grew up in his career with Drew Brees, and I'm sitting here thinking, how does he how does he see Drew, you know Drew Brees and Mitchell Trubisky? Like I I I was thinking more from the standpoint of you know, reaction time and decision-making and management, but the way you broke it down to say it's because of the baseline and the footwork and the dropbacks and the type of throws that he can make and, and that in the vacuum of it, that, that makes sense why he looked at it from that standpoint, because yeah, maybe you wouldn't necessarily draft a Deshaun Watson. <laughs> you wouldn't draft a Deshaun Watson for those offenses because Watson you know, Watson, as we've talked about here before, you ask him to throw the deep comeback or the deep out when defenses can pin him into that situation. Good luck to Watson being able to throw exactly. those types of yep. passes. He he doesn't do it very well. Um, but ask, you know, you know, but Mitchell Trubisky can make those types of throws. So if they ask him to do that, well, he'll do that all day long. The difference is, is that you need someone who has the mix of – decision-making ability and um, anticipation and game management skills along with the arm to do both. You know, Matt Ryan is an example of someone who can do yep. all of those things and he can function in that type of offense. But I, you know, I was focused on one end of it, but I see why they're focused on the other. I just, it, it makes sense that there's also, you know, there's that whole, kind of corporate thinking or even I don't want to call it militaristic but you know certainly there's a there's a level of thinking involved with that where I can see that things are more black and white maybe or they try to make them more black and white than they are and, and it could even be it could yeah. even be that it's an unconscious thing because yeah. it could be hey this is what I've learned this is to me what's always been successful in New Orleans We've won a Super Bowl. We've done all these great things. It's allowed me to move up the rankings because this offense needs these skills to be successful at quarterback. So yeah. behind in his head, even if he's not thinking, I don't like these things that Watson does, in the back of his mind, he's like, yeah, I don't see him doing these five or six things that I believe are essential 
to being a productive quarterback in the NFL because the only thing he's seen is quarterbacks be successful in his offense. In terms of, I'm sure he's seen it when he's watched other film, but he's been ingrained in that offense for so long. I think it does start to get in your head at times. Yeah, it's be, it's like a silo thinking. Yes. Um, you know, you we, we think of the NFL as, you know, if you're an NFL general manager or someone w- working their way up through an organization, you think that, you, you probably think as an outsider that these guys are like, you know, have all this time to study to yeah. study the NFL and like look at all these different players and know everything about everyone. And what you're really looking at is like someone in an economics department who's studying this specific form of industrial behavioral economics, you know, and then somebody else is studying like finance, you know, and 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 this particular, you know, this particular formula and they're like you know the the the, what they're looking at is like literally like the pinhead of a a needle exactly and and so as a result of that yeah if you're if you're your your mindset is very narrow like that then it is going to be siloed to that extent that you're thinking you're making a bold call by saying we're going to go with trubisky over watson um, even because I people people have talked so well about Watson, you know, to what may may he has po- may he have poked his head out and listened to maybe in the media or or what other people heard some other people may have said some positive things that he's thinking I'm going against the grain when you know someone like me who kind of gets an overview and watches things from a broader standpoint I'm going everyone and their mother's going to love Mitchell Trubisky for the wrong reasons exactly and, and so when I hear Ryan Pace who like you described so well you know being an intelligent guy who's worked his way up and done the thing he has you know he's looking at it from the opposite point of view and they're both valid points of view they're just fr- from different angles you know it, but it made me laugh because i go well what planet is pace on that he's looking at you, you know that he's exactly. looking at mitchell trubisky is like a contrarian pick i'm looking at it from the exact opposite but, exactly but it makes total sense now why that is and it's and it's one of those scenarios mm-hmm. that i think when we look at you know look at this the final question i want to ask you about this particular topic is does is this siloed thinking that we that kind of is a part of the nfl and has to be because they're so focused on their own team and how to make their own team better is that probably the underlying issue or one of the underlying issues why fewer teams until recently have been about player to ski fitting scheme around player as opposed to trying to put a player into a scheme you know, you know I, th- I think it's twofold reasons i think one is i think very few coaches are creative a lot of coaches are very sort of check the boxes sort of we, we just follow through this is what we've always done they don't really think outside the box and i think that you just look around the nfl and offenses I really think there's maybe a handful of good offensive coordinators, and a lot of them are just the same old, same old. They do the same things the bulk of teams do. And I think part of it's because there's not a lot of creativity. The other part is I think people come married to their system, and this is what we're doing on offense. This is what we're how the players are going to play their positions as opposed to, yeah, this is the general framework of what I want to do, but we're going to tweak it based on the fact that this receiver that we really like and we think can do a lot of good things can't do some of the things we need him to do. So we're going to adjust our system as opposed to forcing him to do things. He does. I mean, I always just look at it, and, I, and I've gotten a lot more perspective now that I have a child, is when she struggles at something academically, I've always been impressed by the teacher's ability to say, okay, why is she struggling? What do we have to do to make it so she can understand it better and succeed? As opposed to just saying, work harder. We're going to keep teaching it the same exact way to every single kid. And if you don't get it, well, then you're dumb. And I think right. that is, that's sort of the fault that I think a lot of NFL coaches fall into the trap of is, especially if you think about it, how does a guy become a head coach? Well, generally, he's an offensive, defensive coordinator, and he's highly successful doing that so he thinks yep my system is what's getting me this head coaching job that's paying me millions of dollars a year so obviously the system's right so i have to force the players into the system 
as opposed to saying, hey, yeah, I may be smart and I'm a head coach in the NFL. There's only 32 of us. But what's going to allow me to keep this job is, you know what? The offense I like is great, but I just took a head coaching job with this team and the tackles can't do what I need them to do in my offense. So how are we going to adjust my offense so the tackles aren't exposed every single play? I don't think a lot of coaches think that way. And I think, therefore, quarterbacks, I mean, all players, but really quarterbacks get plugged in and asked to do things they can't do, and it leads to a lot of failure of quarterbacks. Yeah, I think that's exactly it. And I think that it's just, you know, I think these offenses, too, if you're well-versed in one scheme, it's like you know a language, and then they're asking you to learn a new language. And the idea of having to learn a new language in a high pressure situation scares the bejesus out of these people. You know, and the idea that the, it's it's a it would be a existential threat to their career. I think yep. to have to relearn some of this, especially with the number of hours that they put in, um, and the pressure that's 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 put on them or that may also be self-imposed to some degree, but you know, being in a high pressure, high stakes environment and, and, a, and there's a high demand to get into the role that you just got. It, yeah. I, I think it can bring out the worst in us in some ways, oh, 100%. In terms of what we do to keep those jobs and rather than look at ourselves honestly and go, yeah, I may know this, but this ain't going to work for this team. We got to do something else. And I may have to like jump off a cliff here and try something completely different that I'm not aware of to, to do, you know, that I'm going to have to learn along with well, everybody else. Well, I think of it this way, Matt, we've all dealt with it in life is how many people, including ourselves, are willing to regularly say when they screw up, yep, that's my fault. I made a mistake. There's right. almost always a reason or an excuse. So now multiply that by a thousand because – even for the meekest guys, a Mark Tressman type or a Tony Dungy who become head coaches in the NFL, even guys who look like nerds and sort of have – there is some alpha in them. You don't get to be a head coach in the NFL without having some alpha. I will step on your neck until I have to kill you in you. Well, how many people with that attitude, if you look at maybe people in the Army, police officers, how many of them do you ever hear say, yep, that was my mistake? Let me explain why I screwed up and how we're going to fix it. No, it doesn't happen. Part of what makes you alpha and makes you successful is you barrel through any problem. And I think that's part of the problem that you end up with coaches in the NFL is sometimes that alpha, that toughness, that unwillingness to bend leads to them just screwing up over and over in the manner in which they use the players. And that's why to me what Bill Belichick has done reinventing that offense because anybody who wants to say it's all Brady is is crazy because the offense looks different. If you go back every five years during his career, it's a different offense, what they're asking him to do based on the players. And the same with the defense. And that's why Belichick, to me, he's playing chess when everybody else is just opening the box of checkers and trying to figure out where they go on the board. Right. Yeah. That's that. This was an absolutely <laughs> awesome discussion when it comes to, <laughs> to this topic. I, man, and, and I think it just kind of, again, you can see some of the themes that we've talked about in other episodes uh, about it, but it's just reinforced over and over again, you, you know, in, in different ways. And we, we find ourselves touching, going back and touching upon some of these themes as we talk about you know, the latest topics of, you know, that are happening in the NFL. Um, and it allows us to kind of explore it from different angles. Um, speaking of, you know, hey, mea culpa, things that we missed on, you know, in terms of players, who are, let's talk about eat three of our biggest misses each and what we've learned from them. Um, why don't you lead off with one of them and, and then I'll, and then I'll, we'll switch off. Well, I can tell you, I mean, and pretty much everybody on Twitter reminds me pretty much all the time of my biggest one, which is Ryan Nassau, because okay. when I graded him coming out of Syracuse, um, I thought he was going to be unbelievable. I mean, I loved everything he did. Um, he's the highest graded quarterback I've ever graded. Um, I thought he literally had every tool to be a superstar in the NFL. I mean, I loved his sort of feel for the game. I loved his arm, his accuracy, everything about him. Um, when I go back and look at him now, I see some things that make me say, geez, I, I, I overlooked that. I didn't realize there was some stiffness in his physical stature. And, and I don't know what it is that led to him being a backup. I mean, I've talked to the GM of the Giants, and they were very high on him when they took him and felt he was going to be a potential starter for them down the road. But obviously that never panned out. He's out of football now. 
to this day, I cannot figure out, besides the things I saw on film in terms of some stiffness and, and maybe a little bit of sort of the ball popping up as opposed to driving out of his hand, but he was without question the biggest miss I've ever had in scouts. Okay. I'll say a guy who, while the, a guy I learned a ton from who I could say – I could probably give from a, t- I know I have, I'd say from a tech, if I got really technical, I'd say he wasn't a complete miss, but I feel like he was a complete miss for me. And that was Alvin Kamara. When I watched Alvin Kamara, and especially as a guy who's had a lot of success with running backs, for me to miss a guy at the level that I feel like I missed Alvin Kamara and a kid who grew up, played football about 20 minutes from where I grew up. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I watch more. Alvin Kamara and I'm like mystified by him in, with admiration of how much I love his game now. But when I watched him at Tennessee, I thought he was not a great decision maker. I thought he bounced things outside way too often. His ball security was awful. I didn't really see him run through tackle attempts that I would call um, substantial. And so what I saw was a space player, like a really good space player who could catch the hell out of the football and it, it led me to think about separating different types, doing different types of um, grading, giving like an overall grade for players who could play in space as opposed to players who could do, you know, where I factored between the tackles work at a higher at a higher priority. And so when I separated them out, Alvin Kamara was the top of my board more in space, but I really was. I really had reservations about him working between the tackles, protecting the ball, making good decisions, you know, between the tackles without trying to bounce things out all the time. And that first year watching him one, protect the ball (laughs) and and, and do that alone. I was so impressed with how that was, that was no longer an issue. Um, And then second, how well he ran duo and how well he like, worked inside and then like how physical he was and i and i started to realize that whatever i saw in the the nine or ten games that i watched of him um i must have not believed i just didn't see enough to project that he was going to run through contact the way he does because this he has incredible balance Um, he has yeah and he has this almost extrasensory perception in the way that he can anticipate when someone's going to hit him or when someone's making contact with him. It's like he feels the contact to his legs and can, can get and can quickly gauge how much pressure's on there to adjust his feet in a way. And the way he pulls up and slips tackles and gets and really moves his feet on this micro level I've I've shown over and over again this season on Twitter. He's just to me, he's a magician, and and I just I'm he's he's probably my favorite running back to watch in football. But I, I go back and look at my evaluation of him, and I just want to tear it up. I mean, it's just it's, it's it, 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 it just I hear you, man. Laugh. You're gonna it's, have some it, of them. You, you, there are, and it's just like you, you know because it's the it's the contact, it's the contact balance, it's the ball security, and those are all things he does well. But I I was convinced I had tape that showed over and over again how, why this was going to be a fumbling machine. This was going to be <laughs> C.J. Spiller with fumbles. Like that's what I thought I was. You know that this is what I thought I was seeing and. <laughs> Uh, uh, who might just be a great space player and he turned out to just be a great a superstar <laughs> yeah <laughs> now, now i'll follow that up my next my, my next miss is also running back but a completely different guy who i think you'll remember Graydon is a guy named jonathan dwyer who was oh, sort yeah. of a power back at georgia tech yeah. um put up on uncon- i think he had 1600 yards his final season in that offense and I really thought, I mean, I thought this kid was going to be an elite power back in the NFL who could contribute in almost any way you used him. And I loved, to me, watching him, I thought this was a kid who could break tackles. He had great awareness and instincts. Um, he could follow his blockers. He could cut off that, to cut off the blocks, get to the space. 
And it was amazing when he got to the Steelers and first he went in the sixth round, which in and of itself I was stunned at. I mean, I thought this was a guy who was going to go first or second round. Um, and I got the Steelers when they got him. He said, yeah, we like him. We think he can be sort of a, a power inside runner, but that's about it. And he had some success. I think he had three or four 100-yard games in his career. But we're talking to the scout for the Steelers and also just watching Dwyer, it became evident that the offense at Georgia Tech really sort of in either disguised or I missed it because it was so rarely shown was the lack of burst because in that offense, the holes were so huge yes. that oftentimes it, it sort of was deceptive. And then he would get through the line of scrimmage so quickly that it wouldn't occur to me, gosh, he really looks slow there. And when I go back and watch film of him now, I say, you know what? I can see where the hole was so big and he got – beyond literally not just through the line, but he got beyond the linebackers in a flash. And now I can see that it wasn't really him. It was the fact that, that off- the defense gets so stretched by their, the offense that Georgia Tech ran until they changed coaches that nobody could get to him. If the, play, if the offense ran the play correctly, he was going to get 8 or 10 yards. And for whatever reason, I could not see that when I was grading him. And I didn't, I, I didn't see the lack of burst. I didn't see the lack of wiggle. And those two things, along with the lack of instincts, because when I watched him in the NFL, he clearly could see stuff if it was right in front of him, but he couldn't anticipate backside holes opening, didn't see stuff when there was no hole. He couldn't sort of figure out where a little spot to get skinny and go was. So it was clearly one of those ones where I didn't put in enough time and energy really devoted to that offense to figure out what he was missing that wasn't being shown often enough in that offense to make a thorough evaluation. So I did not do a good job of really doing my homework. And I should have gone back and watched other backs in the same role as him to see how they performed in that role at Georgia Tech and then try to sort of extrapolate and say, okay, they were missing these things when I look at them. They couldn't do it in the NFL. Why am I thinking Dwyer is going to be able to? Because that one I missed on big. Yeah, that's a great point. And I love how you talked about the way the the scheme impacted your view of the player's physical abilities, because that obviously is a is a big thing that can happen and that we all have had to learn from. Um, you know, you mentioned a quarterback. I'm going to mention one, too. And I could probably mention, you know, two dozen quarterbacks up until a certain point of 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 my time doing the RSP where I. I really look back and I go probably before, even with the successes I've had, I had with players before I'd say 2010, 2012, I'd say before 2012, I didn't know what the hell I was doing watching quarterbacks. Like I just, I, I really, I really feel that way strongly. Like if someone said, I want to see how you rated quarterbacks before 2012. And I'd say to you, you, you poorly don't even don't even bother you know <laughs> i'll give i'll you know i'm kidding but i mean it's like i'm not kidding about that but i was gonna say i'll give you i'd give you that away for free just to you know you can use it for to line your bird cage but um <laughs> but but the player who really helped me understand that i didn't know what the hell i was doing was blaine gabbert um I liked Blaine Gabbert and you get you hit it on the head when you said that we all can be victims of liking the first thing having a good first impression and then letting that bias sink in and take hold and never change as we watch additional games because I remember watching him against Nevada um, when he was a sophomore and I and I saw elements of his game where I thought that he handled the pocket well, that he was able to. But the problem was, is that I wasn't looking at how you manage the pocket in a complete way. So he wasn't I saw him roll out and make some really nice throws and climb pressure and and do a good job there. But I didn't really see him maneuver in the all the ways that he needed to to show the comfort level in the pocket that I think it that really truly tells you if a quarterback's comfortable in that in that in that space. Be- excuse me, because part of it is is not just whether there's one point of pressure coming at you, 
or what angle it's coming at. But it's to me, it's also about multiple points of pressure. Can you maneuver around multiple points of pressure and do it in incremental stages? Can you do it economically? Do you know when to do it, time it where it's coming at you and it's and you're going to be within a step of it and then you move? Or do you know when to say, I'm going to need to move now? You know, and this guy may be th- four or five steps away from me, but I know I'm going to have to move now. All those things that you have to gauge well. And I, I over emphasized the one game that I really liked of his to the detriment of when I watched his junior tape and there was these awful moments that I just thought, well, I saw what he could do. He's going to yep. be able to do that. And boy, was I, I incorrect about that. That was just like, the, you know, it was a disaster watching him, you know, from the pocket in Jacksonville and what what he couldn't handle. And so while he could throw a pretty ball and while he had a big arm and while he was mobile, you know, the pocket game was just awful. And it taught me that I had to really learn a lot more about pocket play. And I had to learn a lot more about anticipation and that, that the mental and conceptual side of the game that I needed to get on, I, I really needed to learn that a lot better or else I was, Hit, I was going to be so hit and miss on quarterbacks on a level that was beyond even what's, you know, what's a, what, what's a challenge for all of us with that position. It's a tough position as it is, but I yeah. was like, I was going to be behind the curve on even that if I, if I didn't get that together, cause that was a disaster. <laughs> and I'll tell you, a lot of people had that same issue because another good kid, hard worker, smart, physically a freak in terms of athleticism, arm strength. Even quick release when you watch him in a workout, gets rid of that ball in a flash. I think a lot of people looked at him and thought, okay, he's going to get some coaching in the NFL. He's going to improve on a few of the things. He's going to learn how to anticipate pocket present or pocket pressure. Um, and that's a rare thing for someone to do. And I think a lot of people, including myself, thought he would be a guy that may not be ready right away, but would develop. And clearly that never happened. Yeah, yeah. So my so third guy, yeah. I'll go on the other side of the ball here, is a kid named D. Milner, a corner out of Alabama. Um, oh, yeah. This kid was a really good corner at Alabama. Um, he was somewhere between about 5'11", 6 feet, very thick build, tremendous long speed, very physical, um, had great ball skills in terms of breaking up passes. Um, and I really thought, hey, you know, he's never going to be great um, – in, in sort of a, a situation where it's to change directions fast, but I thought he'll be good in man. He could put his hands on guys. He could turn around, all those things. The one thing I sort of allowed myself to get to say, you know what, he'll be able to make up for it is he was not a quick twitch after. Um, and I thought, well, he does run in the four fours. He is almost six feet. He's over 200 pounds. He, he, the, despite not being quick twitch, I kept thinking he'll be able to make up for it because he's big, he's strong, and he does have the true speed once he gets going. And it was one of those mistakes, and, and throughout my whole career, I'd always been taught if a corner isn't quick twitch, you can pretty much cross him off the list because you'd rather have a stiff guy than a guy who lacks those quick twitch feet and, and agility. And for whatever reason, I overlooked it on this guy and thought he could overcome that. And it was clear from day one in the NFL that, yeah, if a guy just took off on a deep route, he was fine. He'd run with them all day. But if a guy took off and and made a sharp cut or threw a double move on him, he just didn't have that quick twitch reaction ability to put a foot in the ground and and, and explode with him to stay in coverage. And he was gone. I mean, he struggled with some injuries. But really, to me, it came down to he lacked that quick twitch athleticism to make up for the fact that he was not a premier athlete. He was not a super flexible guy. He didn't have great agility. He wasn't a guy like, and there are a lot of them. Richard Sherman, no one's going to compare him to a 5 nine corner who can change directions in a heartbeat because you just can't when you're 6'3 or 4. But he has quick twitch feet and good agility to where he can adjust. And even though the adjustment may take a little bit longer than a guy who's 5'9", he's a good enough athlete that he can then use his size and long arms to make up for that millisecond or that he may be slower than a 5'9 guy, but Milner didn't have any of that. And that to me was a guy that I look back on and it frustrates me because I really thought he could be a good one. And clearly he did not turn out to be a good one. Okay. That's a good, that, yeah. I mean, that's a good example. I love how you broke down the footwork there 
in terms of why that is and and then kind of compared in contrast to the to the size range at that position in terms of guys who've been successful who were bigger um i'm i'll go with a wide receiver and that's demarius thomas um i watched him at georgia tech and i thought this is an incomplete route runner this is a guy that i don't know if is going to develop into a route runner um yeah he could Which win is one the of the ball. hardest things to figure out yes yes because if you're at a if you're at a if you're in an offense where you only run a certain number of routes how do you get a chance in, unless you're at a workout <laughs> and in those workouts it's so non-football because yes. you're not in pads you have nobody on you there's no pressure to be perfect with your footwork so you can gain separation what you said about figuring out route running it is a, it's so difficult from guys who don't do it yeah so you have that. What I saw was a raw guy who, if you threw screen passes to him and crossing <laughs> routes to him, he he's going to be a terror. You throw the fade route, he can win the fade route. So I'm like, yeah, he can probably do damage for your team, but is he going to be like your primary guy? Is he going to end up being like a league leading type of producer for you when he can only do these things? And, you know, for a while I thought, you know, and I think for me, what it's helped me understand is that with wide receiver, you really do have to evaluate the fit with the, the potential fit with the team. You also have to, you know, a lot of it is that you have to leave room for growth and you have to kind of look for things like, do they have quick enough feet? Do they have the ability to bend? Do they, you know, and and can they bend in a way that they can come to sudden stop? Do they catch the ball well and show the concentration to make those types of plays? Um, you know, do they show good timing and tracking of the football? And then the rest is like, I may not have graded him. I, You know, I don't know if this was as spectacular of a miss as I'm putting it out to be, because I think back and I go, if Peyton Manning weren't there, he may have never learned how to run routes the way that he needed to, because yep. according to Very our true. friend Cecil Lammy, who was at practices every, you know, every, you know, covering all those practices while Peyton Manning was there, he said that Peyton Manning rode his ass pretty much every day from the first day going, you know, I told you, you're, you're running this route. You got to run the right depth. How am I supposed to hit you if you can't run the right depth? And like, Every, you know, and basically willed Demarius Thomas into becoming a good route runner. And of course, Peyton Manning was a coach on the field in terms of his ability and willingness to work with backs, receivers, and tight ends on route depths, on the subtleties of where the placement of the ball should be, where, you know, where all this should be, and drill and drill and drill extra to, to make that work. And I think that that gave Thomas the, the graduate level um, training that he didn't have the finishing school that he didn't have to become, uh, you know, really a top wide receiver in the league for a period of time. So, uh, but I just remember that sticking out because I just, I remember thinking, I, how do I project route running with someone who isn't in an offense as a route runner? Say, this is an area where you as a, or me right now, when you're in the media, and you're not able to go to the schools, this is where you really, you're, you're at a disadvantage. Yeah. Because I remember I was doing this in the media when Demarius came out, and I loved the physical tools. I mean, he was a freak of nature. He could do pretty much anything you wanted in terms of running, jumping, catching. That was never an issue. But I had the same question. I was like, hey, basically he's running two or three routes. He's running just the quick uh, behind the line of scrimmage wide receiver screen or to go. And that's 80% of his routes. Right. So I spoke to scouts who went in there, and they said, Russ, they said, you don't have to work. They said, yeah, he's raw, but they said the coaches here say he's the hardest working kid on the team. They said any time they give him a little adjustment to what he has to do, whether it's blocking technique or whatever it may be, they say he'll come for practice, and then an hour after practice, he'll work with a dummy to make sure his hands are in the new position they want him to learn to block with. Or – all the different little things that they asked him to do in that office, they said he would stay extra. He would come on days when they didn't have practice to do it. And then you hear them talk about how intelligent he is, how driven he is because of all the problems with his parents in terms of the, the crazy drug thing that went on with his grandmother. 
those are the things that when you go to a school and you talk to the coaches and you start to feel comfortable, they say, okay, he is going to do every single thing humanly possible to become a better route runner. And he is going to be there early and he's going to stay late. So then you think, oh, that's where they, that's where the advantage lies with being uh, with the team and going to the school, because then you can start to make projections. You can say, okay, he may never be a great route runner because he is seven foot three or whatever you want. He's a giant <laughs> man. So he's right. never going to run routes like a five, nine receiver. But if he's going to be willing to put in the time and he has good athleticism and flexibility and foot quickness, he's at least going to become average. And right. if he's an average route runner with those physical skills and the character and the learning ability and all those things, that's where a scout can come out there and say, yep, I feel comfortable planting a top 10 grade on him because I know that once we get him, if we ride him, and now part of that's going to come, like you mentioned Peyton Manning, whether it's Peyton Manning or whether it's a receiver coach who is on him 24-7 and making him learn the individual routes like Terry Rubisky or Jerry Sullivan would do, you can have confidence that you can say, yep, this is a guy that if we are willing to devote the time and energy to teach him how to become a good route runner, he is going to match our effort with his effort, and he's going to do that. And that that's where you and I – Unless we're out of school or we have a contact that's going yeah. in there that we trust, it's hard to make that judgment because there are other guys that have come at Georgia Tech, and I remember the Stephen Hill kid. Oh, and yeah. I remember talking to the people at the, the well, a scout that went in the school, and they said, don't waste your time. They said it's not that he doesn't try. They said they don't feel he inherently understands the concept of routes. Yeah. And it's like, okay, if he didn't understand the concept of routes – and he's very stiff. That's a that's a tough one to think he's going to get real better. Yeah, that was a that was a one that was a guy I didn't like was Stephen Hill. And Neither I did know, I. Whew. Yeah, I loved Marvin Jones. Hated Stephen Hill. <laughs> yeah, I'm right there with you. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, but no, that's a that's a great point, and it's and I think that is. I mean, that's obviously the advantage that that scouts have is going to visit and talk to the recruiting coordinators and the coaches and the, and, and the people who are close in that program. And, and that's a, it's an extremely important part of the process um, overall. So, you know, speaking of, you know, our processes for 2020, who, who's the first of two guys that have caught your eye? You know, it's funny because I've started on the quarterbacks now. So I've looked at Oregon and, and, and Alabama um, and LSU. And the one kid, it's funny, when I started on Alabama, everybody said, oh, you're going to love uh, the two receivers they have. And I'm watching them going, yeah, I like them. They're, they're intriguing. But in all honesty, the kid, Devonta Smith, who's also a junior, I'm watching him going, so what, what is the reason everybody has Ruggs and Judy as potential, not only first-round picks, but people are saying it could be in the top five. And people are talking about Smith like he's not even a consideration early in the draft. And I'm thinking, I, am I watching the film wrong or am I just – did I lose it? Because when I watch this kid, he seems to be much more natural and strong going to get the ball than the uh, – got to look at my notes here to remember which one of them it is that I think he's better in terms of attacking the ball. Um, in terms of – compared to Judy, Judy is not the natural aggressive ball plucker that this kid is. Um, and when I watch this kid in terms of his ability to win contested battles, his ability to maintain his feet in those contested battle situations and get started after the catch, I mean, there's something about this kid that I think, man, he, he's a guy I wouldn't be shocked if when all is said and done and we get through the, the end of the season, the bowl games, the All-Star games, the combine, the whole thing, if he comes out, it would not shock me if he ends up being the first one picked. Yeah. I mean, and I, I can certainly understand that. I mean, I think that there's, you know, I think all three are, are definitely good prospects. Um, but Smith, I, I totally get you when it comes to winning the football and, and with your point with that. I saw the same thing in terms of his ability to, to go out and win the ball. Um, I see Judy is more of a guy who you see functioning more in the slot. Yes. Um, who who can be a guy who is going to make plays over the middle, who's very good at doing some, you know, he's going to be able to run outside routes very well, but you can move him around a little bit. But I don't see him as that that ball winner on the level that you get with Devonta Smith for sure. Um, yeah, I mean, a, a player that a player that I watched um, recently, and I'm trying to think of someone who. 
did I did I talk with you about Jake Fromm? No, no, I haven't. Okay, I watched Jake Fromm, and it's interesting because I, you know, yeah, you know, worked at UGA, and I, you know, so you're clearly biased, is what you're saying. I'm clearly biased, right? <laughs> you know, <laughs> I've never been to a UGA game, um, but <laughs> but um, I. I, how would I put, best put this? I watched Jake Fromm and the way that he maneuvers the pocket, the way that he can handle multiple points of pressure, um, I was super impressed by him. I was super impressed by his feel for the game. Um, he has an, he makes throws that the people were lauding, lauding Russell Wilson for some of the throws he made to Tyler Lockett this year. Um, like at the in the back of the end zone, I've seen some plays from Jake Fromm that would have rivaled that. Um, and you know, maybe not on the level of athletic ability, but in the level of skill of being able to throw the ball pinpoint on the move. Um, he's you know he doesn't have the greatest arm, but it's definitely good enough. Um, and I think he just has an extraordinary understanding of how to manage the position. Thus far, as I've watched a number of his games, unless something changes, and that's the big thing for me, is it's it is very important to, you know, to take into account other games. But I've watched, you know, I've watched a couple years worth of games, and even in the games that I've watched from his earlier tape, where there were some mistakes made that were data like, you know, that were you know interceptions. The plays weren't necessarily his fault for the interceptions or that they were they were decisions that they were he was hit while throwing. The, you know, it wasn't a it wasn't a he didn't see the defender there type yep. of thing. And so I'm, I watch this guy and the more I watch him, the more I think he may belong in that conversation with the guys at the top of the board. Um, I couldn't and, agree more. I couldn't yeah. agree more. He reminds me of what, you know, I I was never a, a huge fan of Kirk Cousins. I mean, like I liked I liked a lot of the things that he could do, but I always had this concern that Kirk Cousins thought that he was like I, I admired it and kind of laughed at it at the same time from afar. It's kind of a a perverse kind of humor thing. But I think that Kirk Cousins on third and fifteen in a crowded pocket thinks he's Brett Favre. Oh, and, there's no doubt. <laughs> you know, he thinks he's he's that way. He's like Chicken Little, you know, in the or, or that or the Chicken Hawk in like the Warner Brothers cartoons where like he thinks he's a lot tougher than he is and he makes throws that his he basically you know, writes checks with his arm that is that his arm really yep. can't cash in terms of what he sees and what he can deliver and for years it plagued him and he just threw bad God awful, made God awful decisions that he shouldn't have done. But then there were moments you'd watch him play, and and there were so many other good things about his game. I think Jake Fromm, if I'm going to be, if I'm going to take the conservative point of view, is that he's ahead of where Kirk Cousins was and what people thought Kirk Cousins might have been coming out and needed a lot more time to become. I think Jake Fromm can be that a lot earlier. Oh, I, I agree. And, and and it's funny. I was watching their game this past weekend, and I can't remember who they – maybe Auburn they played. Yeah, Auburn. Yeah. And after the game, I remember hearing people and reading stuff about people saying his stock was down because of his performance against Auburn. And I remember thinking there were three or four plays, and I see this every time I see from. I haven't graded him yet, but every game I've watched of him play, he mentally seems like he's so far ahead of almost any quarterback I've seen. He never gets confused. He understands what's going on in front of him. And there are three or four times a game where he makes a play that I have not seen a quarterback this year that he would make because he under, he sees the switch or he sees the screw up in the D and the ball's out. When yeah. he, it was probably not his intended receiver or, or the initially intended receiver, but he sees a mistake by the defense or he adjusts to what the defense is doing and boom, the ball's out. He's got a quick release. The arm is my biggest question at this point because he, he almost looks, and I want to see him live at some point, he looks almost frail. I mean, he looks like a sort of a skinny little guy out there. Um, and on those far outs, the ball tends to have a little bit of a bubble on it, which makes me concerned. But 
to me, 90% of quarterback success is above the shoulders. This kid may be the number one above the shoulders guy in the draft. I mean, yeah. he, he seems to have a feel. He reminds me, you mentioned Kirk Cousins. He reminds me a little bit of Chad Pennington. Just that yeah. real smart, knows what's going on, never puts yeah. a ball in a bad spot. And he may be a little better than Chad in terms of accuracy. But, they, yeah, I like this kid. Um, I think there's something to this kid. I think he's really got a chance to be to be a special guy. Like I said, I haven't graded him yet, but that's just on the games I've watched. Yeah, and, that's, and what's funny is I purposely waited not to watch him just because – I, I mean, I always get asked about the Georgia thing and, and it's, and I understand, but yeah. I mean, like I have to go to great lengths to say, seriously, I'm not a Georgia fan. I mean, like I root for him for my friends when we go to, if we, on the rare occasion, we watch football together, or I'm happy for them, but it's like that really, I don't really, I'm not a college fan. It's just, you know, to me, it's like, that's, it is what it is. So, but I just, you know, I, I've seen him, but I haven't really watched him. So I watched Tua, I watched Joe Burrow, I've watched Justin Herbert, you know, and when I've been thus far, and it's, you know, it's early. I still have, I know there's going to be a lot of changes to how I rank them, but Jake Fromm's graded above them so far for me. And I'm, and I know, you know, not by a significant amount. So I know that there's going to be, changes because i know what i haven't seen from some of the other guys yet that i have a feeling i will or i'm or there's a good potential that i will just because it, the grades are somewhat in, are incomplete you know yeah. from game to game but yeah from i just was that he checked off more boxes early on watching the same amount of games and it was and i was super impressed by that so yeah he, he definitely is that guy that that is intriguing to me yeah i can't wait to grade him i'm three games into tua um and like him a lot um like him more than burrow or uh or or burt or a bear or however whoever wants to pronounce it what way um me too um, and to it, he's better, a lot better than I thought. I thought he was a slow paced kid. He's actually got a little quickness to his game, but I can't wait to watch from. And I also yeah. can't wait to watch the kid in Washington. That oh, kid yeah. in the games I've seen, he may have the most natural thrown oh, easy. ability. Yeah. Oh my the other God. Former Georgia kid. <laughs> oh my God. When I see him throw the ball, I'm like, that's how God made to, well, that's how he wanted quarterback to throw. I mean, holy yeah. jeevers. It comes out in a flash, and it is, boom, it's exploding. It's, oh, he's fun to watch. I can't wait to grade him. But I'll yeah. give you my second player because I know okay. we're going on here because I'm doing these quarterbacks, so I'm looking at LSU, and who catches the bulk of their balls other than Jefferson is the little running back. This Clyde Hilaire, Edwards yeah. Hilaire kid. I mean – for whatever reason, one game I was watching, the announcer kept saying Sproles. And I don't see Sproles so much. I think this kid's more of a thicker kid, um, more of a power guy after the catch. But he's got quick feet. He's got natural hands plucking the ball, although there are times where when he has to bend, instead of bending his knees, he tries to just bend at the waist, and that's not going to work catching the ball, um, which, which is an issue. But I like him catching the ball out of the backfield. I think he's valuable in, in – when they do split him out, let him run some routes, he does a good job. And I love his ability to get away from guys. The first guy rarely gets him down. I mean, I'm not saying this guy's going to be a starting tailback because I haven't seen enough in terms of running ability to where you're going to put him between the tackles. And I'm not saying he's got to run inside, but just where he's going to line up as a back and get the ball handed to him and have to create. I want to see more of that. But in terms of 100%, I can already say this is going to be effective catching the ball out of the backfield be a guy that in worst case is a Rex Burkhead type player and in best case could be a guy that you might be able to get him 15, 20 touches, but I have to see more in terms of getting the ball handed to him in the backfield to see if I think he's a running back or more of a guy catching the ball out of the backfield. Yeah, I can see that. I mean, he's certainly a guy that I've kind of joked that, you know, from what I've seen thus far, he's kind of like a Mike Hart type of player, you know, yeah, and, yeah. you know, and, and that's a guy that can give you, he can give you production. He can be a contributor and, and he can give you smart play. Yep, and, I, exactly. and, I think, and I think that Hilaire certainly is, is in that realm there. Um, I'll, I'll end mine with uh, Denzel Mims out of Baylor, the wide receiver. Oh yeah. Uh, I saw yeah. him in this past week's game. Yeah. Yeah. Mims, 
Mims is a player who I watched, um, and I just did a, an RSP film room on him on YouTube. That's about, uh, that's probably about, I don't know how long it was probably about 40 minutes to an hour in length. Um, where I just broke down his game from diff- from three years worth of tape um, and just talk- showed his evolution as a route runner. But this is a guy that has, you can tell as a route runner that he's starting to develop skills to release from the line of scrimmage where he can vary the, the patterns and, and setups in terms of how he uses one hesitation move to maybe using two to, you know, when to dive inside and take the defenders back. Um, and and kind of get into the head of the defensive back um, as the game goes along. He's getting really good at that. He's good out of his breaks. Um, he has a, a, a great awareness of how to transition upfield. So he's someone that he do, he doesn't have that Marquise Lee kind of athletic ability after the catch. And he's never gonna. And I don't think he's ever gonna be a game breaker after the catch. But he's a guy that maximizes his transitions where he can just make that one quick turn he's he's aware of where the defenders are going to be as he's as he catches the ball and he can turn in the correct direction and just get downhill and he usually ends up getting yards after the catch because of that he has terrific body control to win the ball contact doesn't phase him um he's 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 good at the boundary he's getting you know i I think he can, he's got to get better. Like there's moments where I've seen him get two feet in bounds, but normally it's, it's one for him where there's going to be plays. He's going to have to work harder to get to, but yep. he's, but it's, but that's something that in terms of press coverage, I see him being able to um, hit the hands of the defender before they get into his body um, and use a, a couple of different good techniques from that. But the footwork is strong. The handwork is strong. The ability to work outside and inside and deep it, it's all there, and I think this guy is going to become a complete receiver in the league. He's six three, two fifteen, um, and he's and he's a guy that that I just I, I like him a lot. I think he's going to be one of the better receivers in this class, even though he may not be um, one of the most highly touted. Yeah, that sounds like a guy I want to look at. I know in the game he jumped out and made a few plays, but I haven't studied him like you have. But I mean, that sounds like the exactly what you want. Any college player that even has a clue how to use their hands to get off press, that means they're levels above the majority of college receivers. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. most of them, it's just how can I outquick you after you punch me in the face? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, the you know, it's it's always fun being able to get a chance to, to talk about these players. And as you can see, this is a passion of ours, obviously, in addition to a career. Um and, you know, you can follow Russ Landy at Russ Landy on Twitter, um, RussLandy.com, his site, Infectious Scouting. Um, you know, definitely check that out. He'll have a draft guide coming out this year. So I highly recommend you check that out as well. And, uh, of course, you can find me at Matt Waldman R- and, that, and also my site, MattWaldmanRSP.com. And you can check out this podcast at a variety of outlets, um, you know, pretty much any outlet that you want to that you want to download podcasts from the Matt Waldman's RSP cast um, is available on that. So I hope you guys have a great week and uh, we will see you soon.